I request you or it's not required. You can start. I just. Uh, no, yeah, you can start now because we have done it that day. So this is okay. a continuous session only. So uh, they'll ask uh, Nirjar sir to take up the platform for this uh, second part, which is application of geomatics in land use mapping. Uh, first part was on 17th July, which was uh, geomatics technology and trends and the third part will be on 2nd july that is application of geomatics in hydro geology so uh sir as soon as uh, participants are there uh, about 16 of them are here if it comes to 30 uh, i think so i'll uh, request you to take the platform and uh, Continue with your uh, presentation. So, I think the Tahar will indicate uh, green signal for the recording. I think so. It has already started. So, already started. I. So, uh, you just tell Dr. Uh, Lakya to start the presentation. Okay, sir. I'll inform. Yeah. I think the task also informed that nobody should uh, start the presentation. Which yes, was sir. happening last time, uh, which, is, which disturbs the ongoing presentation. I request so, all the. Sir, you can start today's uh, session of part two out of the geomatics and environment series, what we have. Yeah. Webinar six. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Now, yes, sir, you can see your screen now. Okay. Yeah, so, uh Hello everyone, yeah, today we will be talking about uh, uh, land use land cover. Probably since you all of uh, you are uh, you know from planning background, you know landscape architects and planners, you all are uh, well aware of uh, the land use and land cover. Um, but uh, I'll be briefing you about how geospatial technology can be useful in uh, mapping the land use of an area. And what all things are required when we, you know, go for a project. So when we talk about land use, land cover, uh, those are, uh, you know, uh, to, spoken together, but generally are a little different. You know, land cover more or less means a natural landscape or an area, you know, where deep forest, you know, wetland, and you know, other kind of uh, land, you know, water bodies, uh, which is undisturbed and land use uh, documents how we use that land you know for development purpose or you know, conservation purpose or you know mixed use agriculture likewise so uh, it's very important for everyone to understand how to utilize that land you know considering the kind of development that is going on you know uh, really have a development you know it's not really planned though it's you know it's said that it's planned but uh, you can see that what kind of a chaos it creates uh, in terms of traffic and everything. So today, the focus is on the dynamics of the land use. You know, we all live on the land and we all are dependent on the land and we know that uh, it's our most important resource and any development that happens happens on the land, it brings changes to it. 
but we know that you know land is not limitless you only have one earth you know the hands the way we handle and use the land resources is crucial for our uh, social and economic well-being as well as for the sustained quality of land resources so by examining all the uses of land in an integrated manner makes it possible to minimize these conflicts and links uh, the social and economic development with environmental issues and protections you know thus helping to achieve our goal of uh, sustainable development so uh, you know for all these things it becomes very important how we gather the data how we present the data you know how we process the data uh so a good data is very uh, important for any kind of an analysis and we'll try to understand how uh, geospatial technology can help uh, uh, in this process so when we talk about any kind of you know planning project or development projects what are all the processes uh, uh generally the steps uh, you know that we go for our you know site investigation initially right collection of the information then assessment of the data report writing or finding out the potential hazards you know the where geo spatial technology can help you know even before we go for a site investigation we now can make use of satellite imaging you know remote sensing uh, as discussed earlier you know can be of a very great help in such kind of a pre visit site investigation you can really understand all the changes or you know pattern that the land has faced you know over a period of time then when we talk about actual field visit you know again our gnss or you know famously known gps technology can be of a uh, uh, very great use you know uh, we can use our gps to have a very uh, fine level of precision and we can also add information nowadays you know gadgets are you know smart gadgets and you can easily add all the informations in the field itself you know so such kind of a uh, data collection is also a part of uh, geospatial technology now which is becoming a mainstream instead of you know the previous uh, data that we used to uh, collect you know through total stations total stations again a very important and very useful uh, you know instrument uh, that we have but when we talk about gps gps has little advantage uh, over it because you know it directly measures Fr uh, from uh, you know coordinates you know like to longitude instead of you know arbitrary arbitrary coordinate that total station start with zero zero you know and plus there is a huge huge I mean uh, great I mean kind of a software that are available uh, which makes it possible to you know have you know attributes uh, fitted to it at site then. uh when we talk about assessment of all those data collected you know from various uh, agencies and various experts gis can could be of great help even in database management as well as in analysis so uh, and then comes uh, uh finding out uh, you know suitable sites and you know potential hazard identifications and there you know gis i believe is the only tool which can do your advanced modeling so in all the stages uh, as we speak you know gis or geospatial technology can be of a great help only thing is that we need to understand this uh, technology uh, a bit and you know how to uh, you know uh, 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 use uh, or prepare the maps design the maps you know in a way that it has a minimum error since we talk about technology there is a lot of details that you need to understand prior to preparing a map you know these are smart maps you know a lot of informations are you know feeded into those maps you know and even a, a little bit of an error you know will give you wrong results you know and this is the reason why most of the projects you know at university level or at other levels you know they just stay there on paper you know and are, and are not really executed you know or uh, the way it should uh, or it's shown on the papers you know so it becomes very important uh, for us to map everything and collect the data as in gis you know i, I suppose everyone might be knowing it there is a, a very famous saying you know garbage in garbage out you know so the, the kind of data that you you know feed into your project you know that's kind of output that you are going to get so now uh, again we'll uh, come to the basics of the land use right 
so considering that you all are you know uh, in your you know third fourth sems you know and probably you must be aware about the land use map i'll again you know give you some like 20 seconds 30 seconds to think over you know how you used to or how you apparently prepare your land use maps so those of who you who have actually prepared the land use maps i just give you 20 20 seconds you know to think over it just note down the steps or just think over the steps or just count the steps how many steps that you can count to prepare a land use map before we start you know just think over you know what all things that you can do to prepare a land use map you know finding a locations or you know how how would you prepare a land use map just think over it for like 10 15 seconds uh, and i i'll start how i actually prepare you can always update this kind of methodology or there such some processes right even i have developed it for myself you know there can be many variations to it depending on the kind of a project that you do or your expert level you know but uh, some of the steps which i usually follow uh, i have tried to you know structure it out and present it in form of steps over here so let's just see what are all the steps that we can follow to prepare a good land use map you know so first of all let's see first of all what we need to do to prepare a land use map or to start any project what we are supposed to know we are supposed to collect the information about our project site right that's that's the basic thing right uh, uh, probably, uh, probably the project proponent uh, probably might be giving you such kind of an information that where they want to do it or you know what what is the area uh, to you know consider uh, for the projects if, in case there are no alternative areas so first first step would be to collect the locational information so once we know that uh, you know where our project falls second most thing is that we will try to google it you know rather in this case google map it you know and we will try to understand that project site you know study it you know that uh, how can we go or whether uh, there are any kinds of so, you know so site hazards are there or not or you know what kind of site is it is you know so as we say you know pre uh, field visit you know analysis kind of things that can be done by procuring a satellite image so uh, second step would be to procure a satellite image then uh, the steps can you know can be changed you know i have just presented over here in a manner that i had so once you prepare a uh, procure a satellite image one step that is mostly ignored by most of the people even by the experts right that is to ortho rectify an image ortho rectify an image uh, uh, you can relate it uh, in a you know relate it in a way that you know how you align your scan documents you know now there are so, so many different ways that you can take a snap you know it's not exactly vertical mode you know some kind of an oblique mode and then there are uh, you know other software you know by google lens and others you know uh, sorry microsoft lens and other which can actually uh, find the corner edges of the paper and then it can you know straight it straighten it so this is some something of that sort not exactly related to that kind but something of that sort so suppose even in satellite when satellite takes the picture you know it's always not like an adir that it's seen over here you know so this is exactly on left hand side if you can see it's exactly you know a straight line that is falling at some peak of a you know uh, hillock and then on the right hand side if you see that that hillock particularly uh, uh, is on a little shifting so such kind of shifting always occurs you know because of the undulations of the terrain so these are natural things and uh, this is something which we have to consider you know uh, in any project that we do so we have to rectify uh, this kind of errors like if you can see that you know there is a hill something like that you know uh, if you look at my hand you know something like this and photo is taken from one angle you know some some angles 30 degrees or maybe 15 degrees so the exposure of this particular area like in this case you can the right hand side where the arrow shows an exposure of that particular area is more uh, than the other side of that uh, you know hillock so 
if you try to uh, you know find out an area of this particular hillock on both the sides maybe you can divide it into parts on the left and right and if you want to find out the area in reality it probably might be same both the sides on left and right hand side but uh, if you try to measure it on satellite image may so happen that you know right hand side uh, will have more area and left hand side part might have a little less area because that is more exposed to it so to rectify all such kind of you know errors uh, uh it's something called uh, ortho rectification we would require a dm for that usually and nowadays you know even nrsc or from whichever place you purchase they provide you know uh, uh, rpc files that says the national polynomial coefficients uh, rpc files or dm associated with it or otherwise even separately you know prepare your own dm and try to rectify such kind of a image error so you know even if someone says you know that i had prepared map book after purchasing from an authorized agency and it cannot be wrong it still can be wrong because you are not followed the process that you were supposed to follow so such ortho rectification is must while the terrain is very undulating you know if it's a flat terrain it's still you know still okay that you know can be ignored at times but otherwise you know this is something which you must do before uh, you know starting or doing any kind of a mapping so processing is must then you know uh, in gis in particular uh, we have to do a projection system because we don't work on an arbitrary zero zero uh, you know projection we have to have a proper projection system so if, and when you you know go in a detailed study of geomatics you will learn that there are lot many projection systems some of which give a good direction angle some of which can give you good perfect shape some can give you an area you know so it has a lot of limitations you know so uh, which one you want to use uh, is uh, you know entirely dependent on your project or the way you want to present it so that is something which you need, you need to take care right more or less you know people have the standard projection system you know that they usually work on uh, that's general wgs 84 that they have considered you know as one of the standards but then you can always you know change it to your requirement then there is something called geo rectification so those of you who knows autocad you know you can relate it with your scale you know that you scale it and you fit all the maps or overlap all the maps you know that the others have prepared or you have prepared uh, or your team has prepared you know so but only thing is that this rectification is little different than the one that you do in your cad systems is why it's called geo rectification because it's precisely uh, based on your ground control point so wherever you bring the cursor or wherever the, you you know point out the location is very precise you know at the scale of centimeter or millimeters if it's been done correctly so it's a precise representation of the land based on ground control points gcps so the advantage of this kind of a rectification is that you know anyone's work you know old or new you know can be superimposed uh, without a second thought and it's going to fall precisely on your map you know the way you want it and you can do any kind of an overlap analysis uh, overlay analysis so this is a very important thing that you spend time on geo rectification maybe you know people had seen that you know they try to finish it off as early as possible but i would rather say that you know try to spend maximum time in doing such kind of a rectification because it's going to be the base of your project right so the precise precision matters you know the more precise your map is the better will be your end result so take your time one two days even if it takes you know even more than you know go for it spend it and try to minimize the error so once all these things are done uh, you have your satellite image and you know uh, 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 rectified you know there is actually a uh, uh, 
other other kind of rectifications that are there you know i probably might not have mentioned it over here but you know there are radiometric corrections or something which you uh, you can relate it with your image enhancement you know so other than these things there is also an image enhancement tools that are there where by you clean all the haze and you know some fuzzy uh, you know features uh, try to sharpen it you know uh, i mean uh, in some kind of a threshold you know which can be considered uh, useful for scientific uh, purposes or planning purposes you know so with some kind of a threshold you can do such, such kind of image enhancement also so once those are all done you know you what the first thing what you should do is you know try to understand your area you know take a pen paper you know and note down all the features present in it you know and uh, try to map it properly you know that where are uh, you know all those features present because that would be useful uh, at times when there, there are some kind of features which are not easily identifiable on satellite images and those are the features that you would want to go in the field and you know verify it instead of you know just moving around all the places you know that okay our area is like 10 square kilometer you know or 10 kilometer radius so let's just You know, have uh, you know uh, walk over it, and we'll see what are all the features. But here you can minimize that kind of uh, you know field uh, surveys by searching some features uh, that are you know not properly visible on satellite images, and even straight away go over there and first uh, try to identify those features. Then you can definitely go with other you know usual field visits that you do. So that is also important, you know. then uh, once you have identified all the features you know uh, there are specific terminologies that you know are done and there are classification processes uh, that we need to follow you know so there are manual mapping and when we talk about geomatics basically there are image uh, enhancement or image classification techniques you know supervised and unsupervised and you know texture based classification and knowledge based classifications and object based classifications and you know there are various classification techniques that are there to you know to speed up the processes but you have to have a very good knowledge about all those things if you want to use it or otherwise simply go to the manual uh, process of mapping which you understand and which though it's time consuming but it's still in your control but if something that you can you know automate it definitely gis is meant for it and you should go for it to save the time so but the classification technique is also very important and once uh, you know all those clusters are found that you know where are agricultural land forest land and you know urban areas or you know, wetlands wetlands and everything that you have to follow indian standards you know you just don't use your own terminology you know that we all make mistakes including me you know but now now learn to you know follow indian standards so i have i have a book reference for it i will show uh, you that you know later in this slide but uh, those indian standards are very important for preparing a land use map otherwise you know it may not be accepted number one uh by the experts or by your authorities who are going to verify uh, your maps and maybe for your colleagues as well because they don't understand all the terminology that you use you know so if we follow an indian standards uh, that are there then it becomes very easy for anyone to you know understand your map at any point of time you know they can just refer to the book and check the definitions and you know they can understand that what uh, you have actually map so there are a lot of otherwise confusing terms that we use so even i had presented few slides have those things those are draft maps i have not tried to rectify it and put a you know based maps but i have tried to keep the maps with some errors you know uh, over here as well just to show you so once those things are done we prepare a land use map with all the standards all the classification process all the features that we have identified you know piece with precision mapping and all those things we have our draft land use map that's 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 the uh, you know mapping part of it now and then once the draft land use map is prepared there is other things probably you would be following all these things but otherwise many of them uh, still ignore few portions of it you know uh, we follow it uh, with respect to the environment you know concerns uh, but otherwise these are also very important things people generally you know fall short of the data you know that 
you know for a survey of india like other ones you want your map now again there are so many confusions while preparing a land use map there are so many things one is basic uh, the important one is like forest you know i'll i'll talk about it later on in the slide but you should have not just a forest map based on your satellite images but there are special terminologies and classifications that forest survey of india follows right they have their own maps so instead of us simply mapping a cluster of trees as forest you know based on our understanding we actually need to purchase uh, or procure uh, maps uh, prepared by forest survey of india there are again as i told you there are a lot of sites available now uh, which will help you out to you know find out uh, the availability of the such kind of maps and there are other than forest there are other you know eco sensitive zones that are mapped by government agencies approved agencies you need to consider that as well while preparing your land use map then there are topo sheets uh, which acts as a base of you know all the project you know we start off with the topo sheet marking our project on it and again there are you know roads forest areas you know reserve forest areas gangtar and you know benchmark and a lot of things are present on to go sheet so we need to uh, you know consider all those things while preparing uh, land use map and uh, uh, update it uh, in a way possible or present it in a way possible with both the things overlap uh, but not to hide anything that would be the best way uh, even if you know we are in conflict with the government maps it's still good that you know it's presented in some manner you know that uh gives a clear picture about uh the conflict that can be raised uh, uh, later on in the stage so we can uh, uh you know resolve few things before even you know starting the project uh, by going and talking to the agencies then there are again notified uh, industrial areas that we need to map you know there is boundaries uh, of industrial estate in particularly when we talk about urban planning or you know, landscape planning and all uh, then this industrial estate has the boundaries uh, which actually are not really there on any satellite images and at times you will see that even that those industrial estates are there there are you know agriculture that is going on you know over there because most of the areas in the industrial assets they do allow you no know, people uh, in possession of land you know that you can continue you no know, construction is going to go be there for quite some time you know for a while so you have to have your boundaries uh, from industrial estates you know collected and put it on the map because that is very important then uh, after all these things are done comes our field verification you know so this is where we try to verify all the boundaries maybe government notified boundaries or you know uh, uh, satellite the boundaries that we have verified from the satellite maybe satellite is not image is not recent then we can update it based on the field verification there are few things which might be hidden by the canopies of the trees you know you can find it out you know anything and you can mark it or map it uh, so this kind of field verifications uh, is very important no matter what technology we are talking about you know gis remote sensing and you know we talk about all those things but you know uh, it's always good to verify it in field that that that's the last word that you can say you know only thing it will be useful in uh, reducing the amount of time you spend in the field but field verification is must for each and every features that you have identified then there is one another uh you know uh, uh, you can say a uh, boundary that we need to consider especially when we uh, are working in coastal areas you know there are coastal regulatory zones you know, there, there are the norm that uh, government has you know uh, placed for any kind of a development in the coastal area now i work uh, quite a lot in coastal areas so for most of my projects you know i have to deal with crs at boundaries you know there are few government agencies who have been you know authorized to map all these things even though uh, you know you are a land use expert or ecologist you are still not the authority to you know such do such kind of mapping you have to go with uh, any authorized government agencies only so there is a list of it uh, which i'll show it in the slide later on but this is also very important now there are a lot of conflicts when we talk about i'll not go deep into all this thing, but when we talk about cias at boundaries you know some uh, 
agencies are there you know who has done the mapping and there is a lot of issues that has been raised you know uh, with respect to such boundaries you know high tide line low tide lines you know equal sensitive zones that they have mapped you know so but then you have to deal with it somehow you know otherwise these are they are very important things because not knowing about these things also uh, you know uh, inviting some legal legal issues you know so once all these things are resolved then you know the sporting step is your final land use map you know so this is how you prepare a uh, land use map uh, which deals with most of the uh, you know issues related to your construction size and you you know the, the, the legal issues and everything so uh, then again once we talk about a land use map you know again when we talk about collecting a satellite images working over it, on it then it again becomes very important that which season we want to map you know or which period we want to map again there are pre monsoon post monsoon depending on your you know project timing and uh, kind of a project you are handling it again becomes very important to consider uh, which image or which season of the image uh, uh, yeah that you have to map otherwise there are such kind of a fuzzy boundaries you know it, even for anyone for anyone it becomes very difficult to exactly map such kind of an area no matter how expert or experienced the person is you know how to exactly map a water body or a wetland you know because there is a transition from a wetland to a land or water body to a land you know so these are fuzzy boundaries you know that you have to consider it based on some kind of a threshold you know some kind of a technique on logic or algorithm that this would be my boundary of you know water body kind of a thing or wetland or you know other things you know forest so this is also very important for you to understand before uh, you know uh, mapping any kind of a uh, resource so this is just one example of it now uh, when i told about uh, talked about that you need to have an understanding of subject is just because of uh, uh, this reasons you know that there can be errors in a land use analysis in all the stages while whether it's from classifying uh, you know features you know it's times confusing you know uh, collecting the data because we are all at times biased about an area you know when we i go and collect the data and you know extract the information out of the people over there or you know uh, from from the photographs and the places that i have visited you know i might be biased based on my experiences of such kind of an area or such kind of a project you know you have your own experiences so our our, our collection of the data and note the method of noting it again you know uh, also makes a difference so there are errors associated with the collection of the data as well and how you present it you know uh, as i told you if you don't follow the standards there are again there are so many issues related to how to present uh, with colors to present you know for what feature you know so how we present it you know this also is very important and additionally to all these things you know there are uh, errors which cannot be ignored uh, uh, like uh, uh, natural variations you know errors associated with natural variations seasonal that i told you error associated with the resolution of the image you know there are high resolution images available but we may require a uh, very high resolution or ultra high resolution as well at times high resolution image if you want to do a trend analysis may not be available for a few years uh, back you know if you want to do that kind of an analysis but if we talk about like to year 2000 you know 2000 or before that you know there may not be a high resolution image so you have to compare a low resolution or medium resolution image with a high resolution image and try to you know rectify the issues that are associated with the resolution in a process definitely there has to there will be some kind of an error but you have to deal with it and uh, this then as i told you fuzzy boundaries you know there are boundaries which just you have to decide based on your experiences at time and then when we talk about processing of the data conversion of the data you know raster to vector vector to raster even you know such kind of uh, government maps and everything you know uh, it has its own inherent errors associated so we have to deal with all such kind of an errors so you know if we try to work in a very precise manner you know with minimum errors so we can reduce 
all the errors that are coming from different factors you know the cumulative error would be very less or otherwise you know if we try to ignore small errors in, in every stage of uh, the project you know the cumulative error will be so huge that it will uh, you know in the end make your uh, output uh, you know unreliable so those those things uh, are very important from the beginning of the sorry beginning of the project now once this is all understood that what all things that we have to take care of while preparing we'll talk about the standards you know again there are so many standards so many standards that we need to understand especially you as a urban planner you have uh, you know urban infrastructure standards you know systems like uh, there is nest uh, nsdi uh, uh, which deals with metadata of the uh, you know the data sets that you have you no know, data about the data metadata means the data about the data social data infrastructure national social data infrastructure and there are uh, uh, nrdms which generally it's like dst they have their own you know uh, standards that it's more meant for you know research and development and more. the one i told you about you know nnrms uh, national natural resource management system you know it generally has a three level of uh, uh, classification for a land use you know this usually acts as a bible for everyone you know it's everyone has to follow nnrms standards that, that's that's you can say that's the last word you know that people will tell you you know that uh, but it only has a level 3 Uh, uh classification uh, and there are lot of map like a few few hundred maps that uh, table that they have prepared for all different kinds of terrains and usages you know there is uh, classification uh, of level 3 for even like you can say uh, uh, land use then the coastal areas or even transportation so Oh, there are various maps uh, tables that they have presented but when we talk about your uh, urban planning and all you may have to go beyond that at times so you have this national urban information system that's right nuis nuis uh, has high level of classification so for you it may be important to even verify uh, you know your maps with nuis after it's been you know Done with NRMS, or probably you can straight away go with NUIS. You know, then again, as I told you, Forest Survey of India, we have to take care of their maps and standards. Survey of India, which gives you contours, boundaries, you know, forest boundaries or benchmarks and everything. And you have another uh, guidelines uh, that you probably might be knowing far better than me. The UDPFI now probably it's called you know. urdp fi you know urban and regional development plans formulation and implementation guidelines so you all have to follow these guidelines before doing any kind of a project or mapping work you know so these all standards are there that maybe even more you know this is just something which i remember uh, so then there are supporting documents that you have to prepare when we talk about a land use map you know we are talking about large area you know just talking about a uh, you know, small small you know project area only you know the extent of its impact you know so we have to consider all the manuals that are there you know national uh, this uh, uh, wide land use land cover maps you know, and there are at last many of men use and waste lands and many other at last are there and as i told you crz mapping you know so uh, now uh, almost crz mapping has been finalized uh, uh, for most of the parts of gujarat when we talk about gujarat right except i believe for kutch and morbi it's still uh, pending uh, for some reasons right but otherwise most of the maps are have been finalized by uh, nccm that's a chennai based central government agency which has been given the work to you know map all the eco sensitive zones at the fall in which falls in one a category uh, and to map high tide line and low tide line so there are various crz agencies uh, authorized agencies uh, you know there were seven now eight even more actually nine this now is the whole slide so i have just included one more uh, to change seven agencies right but otherwise as uh, sac amdavad is there you know tirumanandapuram there is chennai dehradun goa 
you know there are few more in chennai the last one that i included national center for sustainable coastal management you know nccm chennai so that is one agency uh, that has map high tide line and low tide line uh, for entire india and uh, eco sensitive zones right and now all the other agencies uh, are asked to follow uh, at least high tide line low tide line and eco sensitive zones uh, prepared by nccm only now there are a lot of issues that i told you with uh, the mapping done by nccm right but uh, that stays as an issue because nobody knows who, who is correct and who is wrong, wrong right but then you have to deal with all all these kind of things so but the final uh, uh, word is from nccm only that once they say that no it is there because they are very senior and very experienced people you know so then you have to follow and they also actually you know consult with the local authorized agencies you know here so it's been prepared in, in a very systematic way right and there are other proposals coming from other agencies as well so uh, these these are the agencies that you will have to approach uh, if you want to work in any kind of a coastal areas this is just uh, uh, you know a map i have presented a map prepared by ncsc and how it looks you know uh, there are various path green green part probably see as at one a you know and it's like eco sensitive zone or a restricted zone for any kind of a construction there are other norms you know there is yellow lines if you can see that's uh, cbca i suppose critically vulnerable coastal area that again you know even it's not in falling area of it is not falling in one a category or eco sensitive zone still you have to you know get some permissions from the agencies like maritime board or other agencies you know uh, in gujarat especially to before uh, you know prior to any kind of a project work or a construction work you know and they'll help you out in you know in a way you can clear it if it's possible right uh so uh, crs at clearance is very important for any kind of a project that that is done in a coastal area <clears throat> so i have just presented what are all all in you know one a category and two uh, this this during my you know environment slide so you know biologically active mud flats i was just uh, i just highlighted it because you know when we talk about mud flats or wet area i know it's basically an active if you talk when we talk about mud flats you know biologically active when we say you know all the places are biologically active even your playgrounds or you know ground outside the school everywhere everything is biologically active right so they have highlighted it you know as biologically active so i have just you know highlighted it over here that there are few terminologies so few things that you have to understand you know it's a little confusing for everyone and there are other 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 categories that you have to consider for your project you know and then there is this uh, for environment clearance purpose only i have showed it over here that there are coastal maps erosion or accretion maps that are prepared by again uh, irs and the university that you have to consider uh, for your impact assessment studies you know every project has to deal with impact assessments so if it's a coastal terrain you have to uh, consider the maps prepared by uh, anna university uh, and uh, you have to go with the legal processes that they have given you know if there is stable uh, uh, zone then you have probably have to go with a rapid eia which only ask for the three months of monitoring i believe and then otherwise you know you have to have a comprehensive eia which ask for a three seasons of monitoring or probably full year uh, in a way there are again now if we talk about this shoreline change you know due to uh, erosion accretion there is another one that i had actually found out uh, that's prepared by isro that also uh, you know shows erosion and accretion in same area uh, i had just presented it in over here because both has a different uh, output you know one here if you took see it in isro map it shows stable here it shows there is some kind of a small scale erosion uh you know if you say low erosion kind of a thing you know but then this doesn't mean that any agency is wrong both are correct in a in a time frame that is uh, or the data is they have they have considered so you have to consider at what time this data were prepared you know you just time blindly uh, 
take one of it and start working on it so that is why i tell you that you know knowing all the agencies or all authorized agencies and their work you know if these are made public you know that it becomes very easy for uh, you know environmentalist or planners or any other person you know who's doing some kind of a work based on you know spatial area you know uh, then it would be very helpful for them to uh, you know resolve such kind of uh, issues or at least you can approach and you can learn from these agencies why it was done so for that particular period so again you know <clears throat> maximum amount of data collected uh, even if it's for the same category you know little helpful for your project so <clears throat> when we talk about the classifications that is just the label the classifications that i had just put uh, uh, cut it out from nnrms book and now presented it over here you know so this is kind of uh, label 1 which talks about you know build up area and agriculture area There are other categories in the coming slide, but then in level two, if you talk about build-up area, you, you can further classify it into urban area, rural area, mining, industrial areas, and all. And then level three, you can again uh, classify it, you know, in residential, which will be recreational, public, and level four. Now you you are best uh, people to you know go for level four and level five. You know, you can further classify it, public, semi-public. What you can do, you know. recreational you know gardens and you know all those things even further classified you know parking areas and likewise you know if you want transportation uh, uh, if there is a you can further classify transportation in terms of you know like uh, railway tracks or you know major road minor road national highway state highway car track kind of a thing you know so you can go on you know increasing your level of classification based on the Environment of your project. Same goes with agriculture, land, and forest, and you know other other categories of uh, land use. So, depending on your project, you have to consider the level of classifications that uh, is suitable for your project. So, they are just uh, some maps that I have or some uh, slides that I have kept from NNRMS. And there are few other confusion issues that are there. Like even in NNRMS that I have found, probably I might be missing it, but. Uh, is the category of forest land now th th there is one one thing that i have not found hello that there is one thing that i have not found is trees outside forest when you talk about your urban uh, urban scapes you know uh, like i usually present it as cluster of trees tree cluster kind of a thing or tree clad area but if you try to search such kind of a category in nnrms at least in the 1 to 50000 scale and other scales you know you may not be able to find it uh, or it may not be clearly defined uh, uh, that you know there are there are trees outside of the forest area you know so those are things that are uh, uh, there and that you have to deal with some such kind of standards and there are other issues that with like one one such case that i have presented or one important thing that i have presented that there is of forest land you know now there is no definition of a uh, forest you know a comprehensive definition of a forest you know important national acts of forest in india you know indian forest act 1927 and forest conservation act 1980 but we have kind of uh, uh, you know state level or other uh, definitions that are present for the forest which again you know uh, in the world No. Yeah. So the like forest act in Meghalaya, you know, now it says that forest, you know, if in any area there are reasonable number of trees, say no less than twenty-five per acre, reserved or any other forest producing growing on such an area uh, can be considered uh, as forest. Now, Honorable Supreme Court of India in its order dated, you know, of twelve twelve nineteen ninety six. it says the word forest must be understood according to its dictionary meaning you know uh, 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 the description covers the statutory recognized forest with the designated as reserved protected or otherwise you know uh, so you have to understand that uh, you know uh, forest as understood in its dictionary sense but also any area recorded as forest in the government record is irrespective of the ownership private or probably i, I believe it's private or public you know so irrespective of the ownership it, it may be considered as forest you know if it to for the dictionary meaning 
then there is uh, traditional forest dwellers you know recognized on forest act 2006 it says that you know forest land means the land of any description falling in an area and include unclassified undemarcated existing deemed protected reserves and tourist national parks are all forest area and then there is similar you know indian state forest report which has says that you know all land with more than 1 hectare area with tree canopy density of more than 10% is respective of the ownership and legal status then for clean development mechanism we have a different def definition of forest which says the area of at least 0.05 hectare probably it's like 5000 square feet you know roughly and that too <coughs> with minimum tree cover of 15% only with a tree height of tree at least 2 meter that could be considered as a forest you know so there are all different definitions that are present uh, in india and similar issues are also there in other countries as well you know and then there is one comprehensive or or, or if you can say defined uh, definition of a forest uh, by principal chief conservator of forest you know in gujarat which is simply any any land which has you know uh, trees can be you know 10% or beyond you know it can be considered as a forest and there are different categories of it you know like 10% or uh, degraded forest the density of you know less than 10% then open forest from 10 to 40% moderately dense forest from 40 to 70 and 70% and beyond you know it's considered as very dense forest so you can just uh, from this you can relate it with your satellite image and you can you know try to categorize whether it's a forest it falls in a forest cover or not you know so there are a lot of things that you have to legally follow if you want to map forest so and there are forest boundaries that are already there you know whether in reality it may not be forest maybe there is some kind of a village or small you know some development that is already there but it's still on people if you see it may be reserved as a forest or you know uh, some something like that so uh, you have to have such kind of a map before classifying the forest area and it will all have a different uh, uh, you know you can say output now i had actually uh, Uh, worked on such kind of a report long time back, probably a decade back now, uh, which, which actually where I related a forest shown in a census map, then for uh, with uh, uh, you know Forest Survey of India and uh, based on the satellite images and which conflicted uh, uh, you know uh, or which was different than. Uh, the one it was presented in the you know, census books or other uh, forest departments you know but then they told me that there are all different definitions you know that jungle has a different definition you know reserve forest protected forest you know so all has a different definition if the area is meant for some kind of a development of the forest you know maybe at this point of time it may not be a forest but then you know it's there as you know reserve uh, uh, land for it you know so you have to understand and consider all these boundaries before preparing a land use map otherwise you may fall in some kind of issues you know that we had faced earlier uh, so it become very important is just a simple uh, now map that i had showed again it has uh, it may be uh, may, may have errors in terms of terminology the old draft map and i reported to the final map over here you know so i had not done that uh, but uh, uh, as you can see that i have not tried to hide anything over here though it was conflicting in my area you know project side but then i had found out a way to represent everything that the data about the data that i had you know that earlier actually uh, i didn't know how to represent protected forest reserve forest wildlife forest uh, wildlife zones you know over the land use map that i had prepared and as you can see you know there are there are totally different areas you know but the one that i had map and the one the government boundary shows you know here if you can see at bottom of the map you know bottom of the map the southern side you see that it, there is already some agriculture area some village also there 
but on paper if you look at it it's a forest land you know some some uh, reserved forest land similarly there are protected forests close to the center of the you know uh, map uh, you know uh, there's uh, protected forest and the map that i map you know uh, the area that i map is little smaller than the one that is already there but i map it based on the satellite images or the tree canopy cover you know so ultimately what happened was you know previously i used to map everything as forest land even even i have found out a way to present it but here in this slide particularly what i had done is that you know all the area that i had mapped so instead of putting it or categorizing it as a forest you know you see some some areas that i had done is are falling outside the forest area so what i had done is i i had recategorized it just for the sake of this project uh as tree clad area because this the like you know this is a cluster of trees that i have mapped from the satellite images and then i had this you know hash and you know lines uh presented for uh the the, the legal boundaries of the forest uh, that i had collected from you know various agencies so i had tried to present it even though it was different i had not hidden anything but i have kept the transparency and informed the agencies that this is the real scenario now both both are correct uh, in the respective manner right but then this will at least save you uh, from illegalities so there is another uh, this thing that you know uh, uh, way of representing as far as urban uh, terrain is concerned you know urban areas is concerned that initially as you can see over here these are there is a the gidc area right gidc area uh, now uh, earlier when i didn't had this the boundary of gidc area actually i, I should have presented a map uh, of what i had you know prepared earlier but it's not there right now but within the boundary as you can see i had simply changed it to open plots considering that it's a gidc boundary and it's already non agricultural land and uh, it's been allotted to all the you know industrial and you know people maybe they have not developed it right now but you know basically those are plots now so i tried to recategorize it as open plots earlier when i didn't had this uh, gidc boundary i always used to map it as you know because there are other shrubs grown over there or some even there some people used to do agriculture uh, still they used to do agriculture in Uh, this area you know they have allowed it because you know there is no development as such in near my future so they have to allow some people to do that you know so i categorized this area entirely in a different manner you know i had shrubs earlier and you know agriculture or fallow land mentioned over here but then when i found out that in gidc area you know when i have talked to those Uh, you know, uh, people over there. They said it's better to, you know, at, at least at this point of time to put it as open plots and not shrubs because these are already allotted plots to some of the other industry people. You know, so then this is how it this you know uh, data uh, changes whole your land use. So it's important to collect uh, you know the maximum amount of data that you can you know from various agencies. this will reflect in your final uh, you know maps and results so this is just something about the land use uh, uh, that i wanted to you know inform you how to prepare a proper land use uh, as an expert or you know as a person coming from that kind of a background you know but when we talk about uh, uh, land use uh, our work just does not stop over here when we talk about projects you know, as planners or you know uh, 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 or you know architects landscape architects and you know uh, uh, environment planners or other things uh, we have to uh, go beyond uh, this map you know we have our responsibility is also to uh, you know compile all the data from other experts because land use expert is one such fellow or over whose work you know everyone's data is going to be super important you know maybe planner planner planning maps of uh, designs are going to be super important on land use map maybe be an ecologist or you know pollution hydrologist uh, you know or solid hazard waste management experts you know how they want to 
design their you know uh, plants you know everyone's data is going to fall on land use so land use expert is one who needs to understand all the subjects to greater or smaller extent and who needs to support uh, all the other experts and uh, knowledge of geoinformatics is very useful uh, in this particular case and then you also have to properly understand their subject you know what issues they might be facing what impacts they might be having you know in their domain of expertise so you have to understand so what else a land use expert need to do beyond just mapping so let's say about talk about a little little about your project steps you know prior to a receipt of project you know you have to understand the overall project land use expert has to understand everything you know to an extent he can or with help of you know teammates then also visit the site you know with uh, coordinators of the project and understand uh, you know prior to you know starting the work then there are pre feasibility stages that they have to for, uh, you know you have to do then interaction with all the functional area experts as i told you you know to get the holistic view of uh, at present in terms of an environment impact assessment but then you impact assessment is a part of your you know uh, uh, you can say planning as well you know once you have any kind of you know construction activities you have to take care of the environment impact you know so interacting with all the other functional areas to get the holistic view you know that as i told you you know you have to understand or take help of ecologist or you know hydrologist or geologist or soil expert or water chemist or you know uh, uh, other areas you know expert solid waste or hazard risk analyst you know every everyone so you have to understand so and then to identify the gaps and subsequent works towards addressing other team members work and you know sampling location now everyone has to uh, do a sampling with respect to their functional area so you can also help them design their samples you know from where you can collect it you know because you you are one person who is going to survey all the areas you know which other experts may not go everywhere but you have to go so you could be a or uh, you could be a very good resource to everyone then to ensure the quality and validity of the baseline data you know and development of a methodology now when i used to work on any projects you know most of the models even i'm talking about the planning planning people right now right planners then you you have such kind of forecasting you know algorithms that what we how it's going to look after 15 years you know how if we have such kind of a project you know what is uh, the projection of population projection or where is the bias you know where the industries will grow or where the residential areas will grow or commercial zones are there you know green areas are there and all those things so you have your own uh, models uh, to uh, you know forecast uh, the development uh, of the future so those all those things are given to or discussed with the land use expert because everything has to fall on land use right so you have to understand their methodology formats and you have to give them or support them in their solutions as well because you are one person who knows little bit of everyone every everybody is there uh, uh, you know category analyzing and interpretation is there now another here i have highlighted in red just because you know you have to ensure that all potential impacts you know abnormal or accidental conditions are addressed with your quantification of uh, the you know uh, applications so and potential impacts by other functional areas which might affect the land use you know you may not know uh, that uh, you know what's going to in uh, which which uh, you know category or which uh, uh, thing is going to impact on your land you know some industry has blast you know we have some kind of an impact on this thing some kind of a uh, hydrological hazard you know some water pollution will again be associated with you know uh, ground water and agriculture that will be linked to agriculture and agriculture is again associated with you know, socio economic and you know ultimately it will affect the land use as well as uh, you know the migration of the people the pattern and all those things so you have to understand every associated link and channel to forecast the future
uh, issues, you know. So then you have based on that you can prepare and management plan and you know store and all those things are legal things, you know. And submitting the final report and post your public hearing, you have to address all the issues, suggest alternative locations and designs if there are any, you know, in your project and leave you the final uh, meeting, final as a report. So these are all the steps that you have to consider. So when we talk about impact now, now from uh, mapping we are uh, now uh, uh, going a little further with impact assessment, you know, now impact on uh, land use. So which categories uh, uh, from where uh, uh, impact can be uh, there on, uh, can, can fall on a land use. So this can be from geology, from hazard waste sites, you know, some kind of a soil uh, associated with some leakage and all hydrological issues, you know, air pollution, water quality, uh, that may be again associated with some kind of a, you know, industrial hazard or leakage or any other things, socio-economic, you know, uh, RR or CSR activities and all those things, ecology, hazard and risk analysis, noise and vibrations, these are all the categories that you have to, uh, you know, consider while preparing uh, uh, any report on a uh, land use impact, you know, so how to go about all this. These are all the categories that are there and every expert is going to be needed and going to be, going to support you in all these things. But you have to have a good methodology uh, for, uh, you know, generalizing all these uh, impacts, superimposing, giving a weightage system to uh, those kind of an impact that which impacts you have to consider as a higher weightage or high risk. Uh, and which that either you can ignore or you can uh, maybe of uh, relevant, re relatively less important and everything, you know, so that weightage system of all those uh, uh, impacts is also important. But in general, I just uh, try to uh, prepare a flowchart, it's not a very good flowchart, but just uh, an idea that I wanted to give it to you that how you can uh, go with your project development you know, stage by stage, you know, what all data are required and how you can uh, develop a model in GIS uh, to actually, you know, reach your goal of, uh, you know, uh, successful project development with, you know, minimum impact on the environment, you know, to achieve sustainable development, as they say, right? So, like, suppose we have already talked about that satellite images are needed, topo sheets are needed, census records are there, you know, terrain models are required, environment data are required, other ancillary data, you know, or saver, this is important to some of our project, you know, are required, meteorological data are required, maybe there are a few more which I might be forgetting, but a lot of data are required. And so how to go about it? I have just, this is a good, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, basic model that I have tried to show to just to give an idea. So like satellite, when we talk about satellite, what can we do with satellite images, right? We can have a land use map. We have already prepared a land use map. Now, if you want to understand the pattern, we can prepare a land use map of earlier areas and you can do some kind of a uh, analysis from that, you know, then from satellite images, you can also find out where the forests are, from Topo sheet also there are forest boundaries present. Then census records, what we can find out from census record, like we can find out village boundaries, there are also uh, from Topo sheet you have drainage, uh, uh, that it can be done from topo sheet. You can have contours. You can have a topograph. Your city data from topo sheet as well. You know. So uh, uh, from topo sheet, you can also get village. But this village would be probably Kamkal only, or uh, location of uh, center of uh, you know, some particular village. And from 3D data. So from where you can get all the 3D data. We already discussed. In the last lecture, right, there are SRTM, Aster, you know, differential GPS, other 3D satellite. Even now, drone is coming up. You know, we, we had to discuss later on, probably, but from drone also, you can create generate 3D models. You know, so from these 3D models, you can have your elevation map. You know, then from elevation, it's just not elevation, but slope and aspect. You know, slope, how slopey the terrain is, whether we need to. You know, cut, do some kind of a cut and fill analysis, uh, some process or aspect means, you know, slope, but in which direction, you know, north, north, east, north, south, that's the aspect map, you know, that is also important. These, these are important probably 
during the flood hazards and some some something of that sort you know that where the you know water channel will channel out you know where, where it will move uh, uh, you know during such kind of a scenario so all such kind of uh, data can be generated from a 3d data that is coming from various you know sources and all the other environment related data which experts will help you you know air pollution experts or hazard or risk analysis forest and ecology crz geological people you know geologists hydrologists you know ground water chemists uh, you know all the other environment related data that you can get then other ancillary data could be anything you know i have just map, mentioned like some resource maps from the other government agencies transportation networks or other such any kind of a data that is there available other than from this thing so now coming back to satellite images as i told you we we can have a land use change detection a change analysis uh, map from that we can find out the trend analysis so how the trend is going right now this will be useful in your urban planning you know uh, or land use planning that what would be the future trend you know where where is the bias you know industry if it's growing which growing in which direction you know and we be which manner residential area you know where people are interested to you know buy the houses or where it's growing you know so such kind of a trend can be easily uh, you know identified from a uh, you know land use change analysis maps so this is good for planners then you can always validate uh by going to the field and you know uh, see what or other other you know uh, associated issues with it you know some kind of a government notifications or what what had change made this change you know so you can do some kind of a field checks and validation then from drainage map you can have a drainage density or flood you know uh with especially within some you know kilometer radius from your project you need to have a flood model for that then from village you can have a population amenities uh, population plus amenities you know census book uh, probably it, it has all these things now and it's available online now you know then check for you know ground realities and public demands and you know what exactly is the real scenario over there and you can have your socio economic map or socio economic report uh, and if it's close to your project site and it requires a rehabilitation or something like that you know Uh, rural rehabilitation or if there is csr uh, that needs to be done you know now actually from uh, corporate social responsibility uh, now they are probably you know considering their corporate environment responsibility we will not talk even, uh, much about it but cer is the other term that is now you know generally considered for this kind of activities along with csr then from elevation you can find out what are accumulation zones what where are the depressions you know so this you can find out the water accumulation zone this which is very important during the rainy season especially you know when there is a high flood uh, or rain you know you can see which roads can be blocked or can be damaged and you can plan out an alternative routes about either you can you know increase the elevation or you can uh, a uh, uh, plan an alternative route that if in case such kind of a situation occurs in future then there has to be an alternative route to our approach road to our industry or our plan you know so such kind of analysis you can do it from uh, you know 3d elevation models as well and then meteorology rainfall data and all this gather you have to have a very good model for it you know there are various multi criteria analyses or various you know maybe you have your own planning models Um, which will give you a suitability map. This suitability I have mentioned as an industrial suitability map, but this you can prepare it for any kind of a scenario. Maybe maybe you know your uh, residential or commercial or you know some kind of planning township. You know so you can have such kind of a, a model run, uh, run for uh, any kind of a suitability map. So once you have all the zones, now this will give you the zones that which are the most suitable areas for your project or the, the development that you want to do right so once you have all those pockets of you know suitable areas you have to find out the base one so you have to go with your own micro level planning that you know which would be suitable for that 
a particular project that you are handling right now. So micro level planning would be there, you know, where you can get all the environment clearance, where all the feasibility of people is there, you know, to approach and everything and you know other issues that you know, you know, as a planner. So micro level planning happens and then you know you finalize a project site. And once these project sites are finalized, ultimately what we talked about, you have to go with all the impact assessments again that you know if this is the project site now that we have finalized. What would be the project probable impact? Uh, you know, with all the areas that are very close to our project, or you know, associated uh, uh, with the, the the features that are present uh, at the project site. You know, nature or otherwise. You know, all, all things that you have to consider. And you probably may have to go for environment clearance, which will, in any case, uh, you have to deal with all these things. So, such kind of a model can be done, and it's a you know concise uh, way. Or to prepare a report in which we give a clear picture about why you have considered the site, what are the key objectives, plans, and why it is suitable to the environment and all the local people. If we have uh, you know project coming at this particular area, so this is very important. So in general, now I will just generalize everything that you know, like we talk about the impact. You know, like in case of a land use right now, so impact. Can come on land use, you know, fall on land use from any angle, you know, socio economic, the way people handle the, uh, the land, you know, air pollution. If there are some, some uh, you know, uh, pollution control measures not taken properly or some equipment get damaged, or you know, some accidents happen, you know, like you, know, you have seen a lot of cases that are there, you know, I don't want to name it, but you already know that how hazardous, you know, the viruses and this thing chemicals has grown and uh, in past and you know changed the whole scenario of that particular area so then there are other health hazards associated with these even the noise pollution and hydrological uh, you know uh, hydrology as i told you know, groundwater quality reduces or the groundwater itself uh, you know uh, level goes down then also it will affect the agriculture or uh, the you know the percentage of water that we get on land and the whole scenario can change, you know. Uh, so, likewise, geology, soil, ecology, you know, solid waste management, and water quality, and all these categories will have at some of the other stage impact on the land. You have to mention or deal with it, and you have to, uh, uh, in a proper way, uh, mitigate it. You know, uh, what are the measures that you can do. So, that is again a part of a land use expert that you have to also give a solution as a team member. How to mitigate all those uh, impacts uh, in their respective uh, domain and uh, your domain as well. So that is also a part. So when we talk about um, impacts and its mitigations, what what are the things that we have to consider? You know, what are the things? Some basic logic or the fundamental thing that we have to consider for any impact analysis. What are those? One is the source of impact you know from there the impact is going to come you know if it's hazard risk it may be some kind of an equipment that not the, the storage tank that can blast or pipeline that fast to blast or water quality then you know maybe there is a bore well and industrial is dumped some kind of a chemicals in this or maybe some kind of a pollutant that leads into it you know or leak by some leakage storm water drainage so this can happen you know what is the source of the impact you know, we have to identify all the possible shows in all the possible categories or domains, uh, and we have to uh, jot it down. Then, what would be the source of the impact? Then, when that is done, we have to understand what will be the extent of the impact. Now, this can be only done with again GIS, right? Because it's something which you have to present it on map, you know. So, which is the extent of the impact? Like, if there is an air pollution, you know, even uh, some kind of a damage in air equipment, the, the chemicals, uh, you know, SOX, NOX, and everything, it can flow to kilometers and kilometers away and can damage the crops or you know, surface water and can also have a health hazard. It's a little close to the you know impact area, you know, still few meters. Uh, than that, you know. So air pollution may have a larger extent. Water can be uh, impacted, uh, can impact an area in large or small extent. It's really unknown because there are no aquifer maps that we have right now with us. You know, good aquifer maps 
that we can really rely on you know though of course there are not many who be paid by uh, central ground water board and which are very good as well but still the, is something which is not visible we cannot really understand it or consider it as perfect from anyone right so such kind of an extent we have to understand you know that what would be the extent then again the magnitude of that impact you know when you talk about extent you know maybe it's going to impact some say like 3 km but what would be the magnitude so close to your project may be having a severe damage to your health maybe death you know anything i mean if we are very close like 500 meters or, or maybe you know, like 50 meters 100 meters and subsequently the you know magnitude of the impact will get reduced so we have to have those zones of you know or range of you know uh, magnitude or you can have confuse of it you know which shape says that uh, that this is a real 100% hazard to health and this at like 50% hazard to health this particular zone and kind of thing so such kind of representation on map you know especially on a land use map it's very useful so having a data of such kind of a hazards or coming from all the other experts and superimposed on land use will give you a very clear idea of how to mitigate it and the receptors of the impact you know who's going to be impacted livestock you know animals people agriculture water bodies so who are the receptors of the impact we have to also identify that if such kind of a uh, uh, accident happens then who would be impacted the most in which range you know so if we can develop any kind of an artificial intelligence system or if we know a prior to uh, you know execution of all these projects we can have a very good idea about you know how to uh, have this kind of a uh, quick uh, you can say actions Uh, when actually something of that sort happens, so you know, uh, we have to know the frequency, duration, time, reversibility, whether it's reversible or not, and everything that is there about the impact, and we have to help all the uh, you know functional area experts, uh, you know, associated with that particular project. You know, so I just move a little quick now. So just uh, to have a checklist, you know, to have such kind of what questions. we need to ask you know so you you, you can just think oh, 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 at your end you know that what things that we need to ask to map such kind of an impacts will there be like will there be will the existing land use get significantly altered from the project like if we talk about salt pans and something of that sort it may not but if we talk about urbanization some industrial projects it may will the proposal involve alteration of natural natural drainage systems Will the eco-sensitive zones or wetlands get altered? Does the project require shifting of existing population or villages? What are the likely impacts of the project activities on existing facilities or you no know, land use, ecological, biodiversity, essential to the project site? I had actually a very local example, just a, 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 a very local example of two, one or two projects which I actually uh, uh, had seen. Uh, not as a land use expert but in general by moving around the places you know this this some area in gandhinagar itself you know uh, close to amdavad gandhinagar itself there i used to go for a photography you know I, i'm not going to mention the place uh, but this is a bird nesting site and there there was this particular location that i have my, mentioned sand mining took place you know uh, and we usually used to go there for photography of you know beetles and there is like hundreds and hundreds of nests of beetles and i don't know the, the whole area you know when it, the sand mining took place you know i mean i don't know what have happened to those birds you know there are still i mean we still go for a photograph and fortunately some somebody has actually uh, filed an uh, you know rti and Uh, separately on hold but you know <clears throat> as a human or as a as a how 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 you know and how much of a person you know you have to consider all these things uh, it's not just that you get a clearance of some kind of a project and you start building it not considering uh, you know what happened to the creatures you know already most of god's over there you know you can check in gandhinagar very easy find if you ask any photographer you will find this area and uh, you will see that how many birds are there you see the hundreds of nests are there but what would have happened to that particular portion where they have done the mining so this is one just case another that is just some photographs to show you 
now this is a very close site i have already mentioned it this is all legally done right there is nothing wrong with what they have done but uh, this here uh, i also used to go uh, uh, for some bird photography at thal and then i had Okay, I came to know earlier, you know, that there is one country really near nearby, you know, some seven kilometers where there is a deer park, and this was the area when I used to uh, go for photography for deer. Uh, this 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 was how it looked, you know. But just two years back, now as you can see, if the cursor cursor, <coughs> if you can see the cursor, but from right hand side where this country deer. Uh, part is written, you know. From there, you know, deer used to uh, run from one side to another, and then from this other side and circle it around, and then you know, used to come back and like, you know, yeah, we, we always used to, you know, walk around this whole area. Now, in 2018, I suppose some some you know uh, road construction started, and I was wondering that this deer park it must be a reserved area. Right, so how come uh, you know such kind of a construction is happening over here? But this 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 uh, area just next to that, you know, and this uh, of course it's all legal, and they say that they are the private lands, and you know they have already had a huge investment, and they are going to take care of you know all the deals and everything. Of course, that they will do as promised. But then it's still still. I mean, if there is a road construction that's there, and then these these the scenario is like. 2020 image, right? Just recent. I downloaded it this morning only, just to update it. And then I saw that you know now it, it, it's so much of construction. You know, there is road. There is so much of construction, right? You know, uh, above the the area that's mentioned as deer park. But that is where the deer used to run. Or the, there's still a lot of space. So they, they still not like you know uh, they they'll be confined to an area. But there's still a lot of space there for them to move around and forest. Of, of course, they, they say the reserved area is somewhere little beyond this area. It's not exactly this area, but when this is a playground of all the deers, you know, and so many people will start coming to stay over here. Vehicular pollution will be there, you know. Activities would be there every day and night. Deers are such animals which are scared. You know, even if we sit around for a photography and they see little hand movement, they run away. So you can just imagine with such kind of a movement of vehicles and people around this area was going to be there, you know, situation or where where they they are going to relocate. You know, there is a lot of space available, but still a uh, little thought that you can give, you know, uh, before any such kind of a development. Of course, the, the, they also are helpless because they already had a huge investment. But still, you know, if they can think about. Uh, they probably as I said, you know, they have thought about all these things, and they'll be supporting all the activities. But it's good. But something that you have to consider. So what's what's the impact in the close proximity of your project site? That's just I wanted to mention over here. Uh, so you have to, you know, it's just photographs. So the thing is that we all have a, a shifting baseline syndrome. You know. Uh, so what it means is that the baseline is always shifting. Now the area which you know I used to consider as a green area, there's nothing else, only agriculture and you know forest areas and only deer, deers are there. And now during that particular project when these uh, people had you know planned or proposed, they would have kept it as a green space, right? Uh, a deer park. They may be in some kind of an ecological park or ecological designs, something of that sort. But now, for any other project that's going to happen in 2020 or after 2020, uh, they would have a different base data, right? They would say that this has a, a, a forest land or agriculture, but there is a township over here, or there is there is some kind of a you know build up uh, some kind of a society or you know some clusters of buildings are there you know so there's already a movement so we are not going to uh, we are not going do, doing any harm you know, there's already a public already over here and we are just uh, adjacent to already existing pro such project you know so we are not doing any kind of any harm so next time when their projects get approved they there will be two societies then there would be third, fourth, likewise, and soon within five, ten years or fifteen years of time, there would be either no deer park or there would be some kind of a very good design which 
can be in sync with nature and uh, you know development kind of a thing so some something i would very good or something very worse could happen in future but the idea that what i want to mention over is that we don't have a, a fixed baseline so it is required that we uh, have a baseline uh, you know with the reference to some year maybe say 2020 20 should be the baseline of any kind of a development so we can relate everything that what was there in 2020 is and what is the scenario in 2030 you know instead of just uh, preparing a land use map uh, of what was the current scenario because that's the only thing that we usually do you know in any project you know we prepare a land use map of existing land use map and we mentioned that there is already a society in our society but we if you could have shown them that in 10 years 10 years back or just two years back in this case it's a, it was a green area then maybe it would present a different picture you know and maybe you may not even be allowed to develop or something or maybe some some, some sort of you know other policies to frame you know to help you out the development with access to the you know such kind of parts and everything so idea is that we have to have a baseline uh, possible otherwise we all will have such kind of a baseline uh, shifting baseline syndrome. We all will have our own baselines prepared by our own experts uh, for that particular year or two. You know, so like if we had this kind of a change detection map, you know, in all the projects, which of course nobody will approve, but if you show what was there in 1972 and what was there in 2007 or 2020, you know, this is one of my projects, you know, uh, I believe the book is also been published on this. Uh, by CCD, Center for Cultural Development, Baroda, but they, they they have done fantastic work in you know all help, helping and preparing and designing you know, all this kind of database uh, and developing this book. You know, I supported them in preparing the maps. You know, so we had this uh, logic that I had you know built for them that we should have like you know highly decreased or deep, slightly decreased or unchanged areas slightly or highly increased area of forest you know that will give a clear picture of what had happened in past you know 30 or 40 years you know so you can see that there are so so much of changes has been done but having presented such kind of a map is a purely risk in terms of development probably because of the existing policies you know so people doesn't really want to have such kind of a map they just show the current land use which is there you know uh, and then they say that is already the scenario and you be supporting and doing all the best things that we can do uh, with the policies you know considering all the policies so see a simple overlay map that i had done you know, i have just presented over here all the overlay maps is not much to discuss on this but just just some slides that i have kept that if you overlay you can get a bit better idea you know so it just i'll just browse through all the maps now like there was this this was particularly for my environment project that where to have a storage you know so they simply designed it uh, as a key plan as any industrial people will do you know so once they are designed an effluent treatment plant and then they are designed everything and then i showed that you know as per the land use there is a natural drainage very close to the etp can we not shift it from right hand side to left hand side and you know try to minimize the damage you know so such kind of a simple overlay there is no big thing in it but some some simple overlay analysis can help you to get give you know get give a better logic and decision you know uh, so this was related to solid this i tried to keep one slide for every category you know there's hazard and risk analysis now they generally present hazard and risk uh, scenarios you know uh, if they you talk about analysis so I had tried to superimpose this though is uh, in this slide everything is falling in an industrial area but then if you can think over it that you know if such hazards are happening and it's an industrial area and if it's going to impact surrounding industries as well you know so what would be the cumulative impact you know it's just not one industry that's going to get affected and it's going to damage the environment but maybe the blast or maybe some kind of an accident will again you know be linked with the industry as in close proximity and that will have their own <laughs> impacts and hazards and accidents that time and you know cumulative impact would be much greater than what has been presented in this particular map right now 
Similarly, you can have an air pollution map. Generally, the experts, you know, present an air pollution map with their own, you know, models, you know, the one that I know, you know, wash and plum and all those things that they have. But we can superimpose such kind of a air pollution <clears throat> over a village map and see that which villages are going to get impacted if such kind of some kind of an uh, air pollution related accidents happen you know so we can have a better idea that if some something of that happens in this particular industry then which would be the in the villages that would be impacted the most and what can be done where we can relocate it in that particular time which would which are the gaps that are there if we go a little beyond it we can also present the land use over a census map we can also have the actual gamters, actual build up area, actual industries that were present, that are present in that particular area, and we can get even better idea that what would be the cumulative impact and where are exactly the people, you know, or where are the agriculture areas and where to shift them in such kind of a place and how many public or how many you know, population uh, in terms of quantity would be. Uh, affected if such, something of that sort happens. So we can have a land use map or census or social economic maps superimposed over a land use map in particular build up areas and all those things and then you can have a air pollution impact assessment done you know. So all those combinations simple all the combinations will help you give a you know, better idea about uh, such kind of a scenarios. Similarly I have simply overlaid on a land use map at what kind of a features of land use, you know, or the categories of land use that might be affected by such kind of an accident, you know. So, yeah, and we can also, with the help of GS, find out the percentage of the area, like if PM10 pollution is there, what would be the area, you know, category, how much agriculture area, or how much, you know, uh, uh, industrial area would be affected, and you can have such kind of a tabular chart. Then noise and vibration is a simple thing that I have to prepare that if there is a vibration of these that you know, which still might affect a very maybe to a very local level, but still there might be some kind of a noise that we wouldn't want to hear from coming from any uh, you know kind of a DG sets as well. So it's just scenario of noise and vibration in terms of you know land use. So you know you can it can be more same kind of soil infiltration issues, you know, during the flash flood or something like that, you know, there, there are some kind of soil which, you know, the water percolates more, you know, and if something of that sort happened and if there's a leakage with the industry or some some project that we had, you know, how much, you know, pollution will be sprayed in which areas, you know, simple soil infrastructure, similarly earthquake, these not, uh, these are taken from IRS or the browser, uh, they have all the, you know, uh, data related to it, so, and then uh, this, this is not a real map, right? This is not just a representation. Any of them are not real. But simple, there are fault line uh, and earth epicenters that you can even show on a land use. And, uh, you know, so even geologists uh, if, can be useful, not just for a geotechnical work, but such kind of a, uh, you know, representation as well that if there is any close fault line, you know, uh, there is a long time back, I remember one case of Tehri Dam, you know, where, you know, the fault line was ignored or maybe uh, it was not really considered to an extent it should have been, you know, and what happened, you know, it flushed out of many villages, you know, when the dam broke because of it was falling on a fault line or, you know, some, something related to that that was there. So even such geological maps are very important uh, uh, just to have a, a clear understanding that, you know, there is no uh, associated hazard in terms of seismicity, um, you know, close to our project. And if that is, we have to build a project in, a, in that fashion, you know, structural engineers can design an earthquake resistant you know buildings nowadays so i mean if you have a knowledge about it you can make changes uh, in your design so that's the idea of you know representing it over here and it's just a teamwork so i just wanted to present that it's not one person's job even a land use map when we <coughs> talk about we are not talk talking about one person's job you know you have to involve the whole team <coughs> you know so it's just some these things that I have mentioned, you know, there are emissions of the dust, air, air pollution experts are required, harmful trace elements, you know, uh, present in water surface, water hydrochemists, uh, experts are required, underground water 
contaminations are there no hydrogeological exposures are there no soil quality fertility you know any degradation of soils that's going to happen from our project you know you have soil exposures degradation of forest if forest cut or tree cuts is going to happen because of the project you know and we have to have you know uh, uh, this uh, ecologist uh, you know expert construction was prior to geotechnical geological and soil exports you know loss of land use or beauty of the surround gas settings you know basically then uh, you, you all are there you know to help a land use expert and vice versa you know so for the aesthetics of it you know and the design proper design of it and then relocation if there is to happen then you have to have a you know socio economic exposure and hazard to the people you know health hazards it still you know doesn't end over here up there there could be many more you know uh, so who can help you out you know uh, in this thing so it's a team work uh, just this just uh, i got this slide for from somewhere uh, which mentions you know what are the direct and indirect and ultimate impacts that can be because of uh, some of the other uh, domain you know so it's just for you to take it into consideration we will not discuss over it this journey hello neja sir you are muted just uh hello neja sir your muted. voice voice is muted hello hello just unmute yourself again sir there was some mistake from my end okay sorry sir that's okay that i i had unmuted it now can you hear me yes sir yes sir okay. yeah we can hear okay it just happened or it happened a little while back and i was just no sir just just when you started uh, the last explaining the last slide okay team work yes sir from the uh, geology part it started okay Okay, that that's the last. I mean, almost the last one. That's yes, not, I was not talking to myself all the time. That's good. So geology experts are there. Then similarly, I mean that the, uh, the land use, you know, designers, urban planners, uh, land use experts are required for the aesthetics and you know to design everything from all this impact. How to save the environment and people from all these impacts that's going to happen once we know that impact zones. in our particular area so uh, we all are required in that particular uh, part of the project you know and then socio economic experts can help us you know health hazard risk health experts can help us to uh, design the relocation areas or find out the you know which would be the best suitable areas for other villages you know if we have to have a rehabilitation or relocation to be done you know so this doesn't end uh, the issues but it definitely uh, you know minimizes the impacts uh, if it's all properly done and the impacts and uh, you know mitigation measures are uh, you know considered properly and designed in a way that you know suppose the environment as well as uh, the current population uh, so this is this is just a simple you know flow chart of what are the direct and indirect impacts you, know, you can check it out at your end later on it's just a representation that you should, you can have it at your uh, in your reports you know as depending on the uh, project and this is just a template that i have uh, presented here that how to you know present all this activities or 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 this measures that we are going to take like during the construction work that we say you know there could be an excavation so what would be the environmental hazard during the excavation that could be flying dust in construction debris you know so what could be the mitigation or the management action that you can do you can spray the water during the season you know uh, cover the water lake uh, obviously clear with fresh soil uh, compact it or sprinkling systems you know you can use excavated soil for uh, you know Having uh, in a, for either green bed or you know some cover some depression of in that area you know or some other you know purposes you know so same similarly if you have a properly structured activity 
hazard related to that particular activity and the mitigation measure that we consider uh, uh, based for that particular uh, hazard it gives a very clear picture for the uh, to the authorities that how it's going to be tackled if in case in future something of you no know, such scenarios you know come up you know similarly you can have for construction phase you can also have a different one for a operational phase that once everything is done and you know, the project is executed and there is an now the usual work that's been started what could be the hazards during that time and similarly you can have your you know chart of it you know that activities industrial activities or other you know planning activities that we do hazards related to it and the mitigation measures you know that can be considered for tackling such kind of a hazard situation you can have a very good template or uh, you know project to project basis you can redesign it but this would be a very good way to you know give a clear idea and for you yourself and your team members to understand that what measures are to be taken in such kind of a situation so this would be a very good template uh, to put it you know <clears throat> uh this is just a land use report typical land use report that i had capital design now change it according to laws you know its introduction has to be there data as methodology you know climate geography project description area and key plan and everything you know i'm not going to deal with it, discuss with uh, on all these things documents that you need to submit you know as a functional area experts you have to have a base of everything you know so nobody could challenge you at any point of time you know that you are seeing you know some kind of an accident happens and people will start blaming you you would be the first person uh, to be blamed you know that you have not taken care of your uh, you know designs or uh, uh, impact and mitigation measures or the observations were not correct you know something of that so you have to have all these things properly documented and based on which you have to uh, come up with any uh, kind of a solutions that you want to give right so at least we have a backup you know we are not just uh, assuming anything and you know doing it because someone has done it uh, uh, you know in that area but we have to have a like proper field observation we have to have a field notebook digital or you know otherwise you know the traditional books you know uh, that you have to have everything noted right then you have to have a report and impact mitigation chart that we just discussed you have to have all the supporting proofs <coughs> uh, with geotag photographs you know the information that you have collected from the people uh, you know and you have to have a, a like in standard right a, so be that you have to follow you have to have your own sop or company that you need to follow you know? so at least you have this documentation along with the report will save you while actually something of this sort or while at least someone wants to you know cross question you that why was the decision taken you know or why have you considered so this all things are there now i have just kept some few there are many actually but i have just kept one page with acts related to the land use you know with respect to impact assessment you know you can just go through it there could be many more right? so you can just take a note of it uh this is just uh, just just for the point of discussions you know uh, uh, that what is need of time you know we have to have we will talk about so many things so we require so much of a data we require so much of support from so much so many experts you know how to deal with all these things where to collect the data and it's, it's a big um, challenge you know so if we have an information transparency or a sharing of data policy you know where all the departments can share the data to public or to some kind of a projects you know it would be very so it is there and uh, you know it has been is being shared you know but most of the department they doesn't find the data you know so if it's all digital and if it's all gis based you know at least that particular uh, you know work is saved you know save so if we can have such kind of a digital maps ready you know department wise maps you know so that would be very good which is actually in working but still it's a long way to go then the maps you get it from the department are never on scale they are very old not updated you know even at times i have found that they don't even have the final maps you know they say that it was updated later on but they don't find it right now or i came across such you know i mean uh, these things also 
uh, uh, people arguing on these things that you know we cannot give you this result if they don't have the final map with them you know uh, so then the ready availability of research and accurate data this can be done through your geomatics or uh, if everything is there on uh, online you know, in the database and multi-dimensional data set that GIS is tackling right now the collaborative mapping initiative like all the departments you know, basically it, it, it meant for departments of all the departments have the such kind of collaborative Mapping, you know, road construction. I just this, this was for some other reason that I have kept. You know, while we were discussing some you know road scenarios that you know as soon as some construction happens or road layering happens, you know somebody will come and again excavate the road and make a hole in it and they'll do some wiring and all those things. You know, so that it's never planned that who is going to walk on that particular portion. You know, during which time if there is already you know their projects being shared across the departments they'll know that you know within two or three months they are they are going to do such kind of cabling over here or even at private locations you know uh, companies that you know that are there then road construction if possible can be you know postponed uh, for a few days or months or you know some something of that sort of basically the idea was that if collaborative mapping is done or if the data is shared between the departments you know it becomes easier for all of us to you know uh, live in urban areas so this would help to explore the full potential of information and quick decision making that's the one thing that i wanted to mention then similarly it's just the i uh, i mean it's already very good size as i showed you earlier uh, in the last lecture you know we have wave borders NSDI has uh, their own you know, state level portals. There are so many state GIS portal is also there, you know. Then we have this Bhuvan thematic data visualization. With us is there. India Varis is a very good uh, the platform for water information. Actually, I was going to put it in uh, this hydrology part, but India Varis is also a very good platform. Uh, though I actually uh, didn't find the aquifer zones right now, but still most of probably they said that they, they have capital, but uh, maybe there is there someplace. But then Survey of India is there, and we also have soil. Now I just came to know about this thing few years back only, right? Soil and land use uh, Survey of India is also there. It's someplace in, if you talk about it, Ahmedabad area, somewhere around Pali area, you know. So I came to know that there is just not you know Survey of India, but uh, a geological survey of India, there is also a land use survey of India. Yes, few years back, I came to know they actually did the land use maps. So, if just somebody wants to refer to soil or land use maps, they don't want to prepare by themselves. Probably they might get uh, uh, from this department, uh, you know, if approached, they are very helpful people. Similarly, NASA has uh, a socioeconomic data and application center at village level, geospatial data for uh, IC had seen for India at least. Right, then we have census book, and there is a DILR, uh, you know, land records that are there. So all those portals are there, you know. But it took me few years or to you know find all these things, you know, over a period of time, and you know, uh, to you know work on. Uh, otherwise, mostly I had to run to all these departments. Now, if we can have an integration between all these, uh, you know, portals, like. Vedas is a very good program. Bhuvan also has a similar kind of a visualization platform, right? But it may have may not have uh, online uh, analysis tool that Vedas has, you know. So either this can be integrated into one thing, or maybe water portal can be integrated. Of course, it will again require a huge amount of uh, or a very heavy servers to handle all these things. But at least if a link could be provided, you know, of all the GIS maps or related portals you know or any government project related portals you know what's going on in one particular platform and it becomes very easy for us to find it out instead of you know just browsing and you know investing so much of time in even searching the online data now you have at least so much of a uh, few of rather not so much of few of the uh, portals that i had found out there would be many, many good ones which I might have missed, or you might, you might be knowing, and I might not be knowing as a, you uh, know, planners. But if it's all integrated, it would be very helpful. Similarly, there are atlas now. I had searched across many, uh, uh, you know, this thing. So 
probably has many atlas so once uh, i had this you know thing in mind that as a land use person you know i must know about the atlas and at least if there are there you know i must consider it you know when i was just searching for all the policies and all the things that i have to consider available maps so i see one time i started searching for all the atlases and there are a few uh, maps or uh, atlas is rather that i found out from various departments so if all if all this can be there in one particular location or one particular site or at least even a link can be provided isro has like what wasteland atlas right and watershed atlas was there at uh, again isro nrsc or c central ground water commission one rebel data atlas uh, you know it was bm tbc coral reef uh, was again there at isro then there was another Side where I found desertification and land degradation at last. Land use land or GC has a lot of maps related to it. Sec site has like national wet wetland at last as well. The river basin at last is also there at CWC. Soil maps are there at SOC, uh, SLUSI rather. Uh, at last of mangroves, GC has at last of mangroves. Shoreline change again as I told you. Uh, Anna University has also prepared its own. ISRO also has its own. Then CRZ again. This is a new map that we have now have uh, at national level is from NCSCM, which probably at least you can refer to high tide line, low tide line, and you know uh, eco sensitive zones. Now NCSCM is a standard. Everyone has to follow, right? So these are so 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 many different atlases or maps are already there, which are all good. So if we can just have it all at one place, you know, for those of you or those of us who are not knowing, there could be many which again in this case also which I might be missing. But this would help. So I just you know kept it over here that this this could be helpful as a land use expert or even as a planner, you can consider some of this data as a base. Then this, as I told you, there are requirement of base level information, which I told you earlier. You know, if there are benchmarks that are readily available now, of course, those are there at Topo Sheet, but we have to digitize and you know georeference and you know search all these things. So if we have a dedicated libraries of such kind of a base level information, which we can directly refer, may we have a year tag to it that this data is of this year. You know, then also it would still be helpful. They are just an idea. This is there is nothing to do with this thing, but. Uh, but this is just an idea that what could be done in future to save the time you know if geotech we have photo library like google photos are there there are public you know wiki map yards and you know so many panorama and so many things are there you know so, which are there but if we can have such kind of a geotech photo library i don't know if it exists right but for research uh, and science community or like for other you know planners or other things you know this would be very helpful instead of just browsing the photos that are there on google maps if google map itself can streamline it that you know these photographs are are either you know take considered for science or research or some you know, planners or geologists you know, they have such kind of a categorized uh, section of so much of photos that they have in their library or if we can have such kind of a sharing of photograph now i myself is working for so many years and i have like thousands of photographs which i had taken and i'm not sharing it in any way similarly other people right they have it and they are not sharing just because we don't have a platform it's not like we don't want to but we don't have a proper platform of it or we are uh, scared that you know there might be issues associated with such kind of photos that we put it online you know maybe some project proponent may not like it you know there are clauses that you know uh, blocks us from uh, you know stops us from sharing the data or photographs Associated with their projects, but environment related, of course, if there are that can be you know presented on online platforms. Then survey boundary of all the government for it. This this was just an idea because I was having a very hard time finding the government data. So one day you know it just a thought came. You know if all the government projects that are there and they have so many uh, you know reports which are very good, but we don't know, right? even being a local even after approaching those departments we are still unable to find so if they just have a, a a platform where they put it as a boundary instead of just the record if they have a boundary of the project areas you know you can just refer to them okay i want to do a project in ahmedabad area maybe you know uh, uh, valsad uh, you know uh, or some other place you know so 
you can just refer to it okay how many projects has been done in this particular area just let's check it you know and so many government projects are already there and they might have generated so many reports and data sets for it and you can just ask them request them if it's officially possible if you can purchase it it would still save your time you know instead of doing a redundant uh you no know, surveys and having your own again another base level of data which may may not be accurate so this if we can simply have a project boundary of all the government projects you know, with respect to you know maybe it's urban plan or geology or hydrology whatever it would be very useful and it will save a lot of time you know so it's, it was just an idea similarly definitions of term again as i told you know there are so many definitions that are there for one particular feature you know if we can have a clear definition it would be very easy for us to you know map, map the features you know then aquifer information system i guess it's already in work or it's already there in india varis right so it's a useful information but at least as of now uh, it's not fully covering i suppose or at least i'm not able to find it through of the data based data availability from authentic this this i was referring to based data uh, you know issues that we all face you know if there is one authentic government site to consider uh, a base uh, of any project you know maybe it's 2020 starting from now or 2018 or 50 that this is the year we have collected the data or this is the year this, this has to be considered as the base uh, of any kind of a change that has been happened you know you can of course relate it with the last year that you know okay from 2015 to 2000 Twenty. This is the change, but all this has already been. You know, 2019. All such projects has been approved, and we are in line or in sync with such kind of you know uh, projects, and we are no different. And we should also be allowed. Of course, you can present it that way. But if there is a base of this thing, we can at least have some kind of a better way of assessing the impact that has happened on the environment because of the you know urbanizations or you know industrializations and all. So this was just an idea, and again. now actually we come to that drone that we left out with you know last time that ortho rectified image i was talking about you know satellite image itself you know has a issue associated with ortho rectification and which gives a lot of error if not properly handled you know now when we have a drone so drone is an ultra high resolution i mean you can have buildings or people mark you know i mean to small plants and you know anything to, uh, at any scale you know so again it won't all be at a nadir uh, or a, a perfectly or orth orthogonal uh, you know projection so all those errors as associated with ortho rectifications and you know there would be so much of shift you know there are pitch you know and you know uh, this kind of shift that are there in drone you know so much would error would be generated if not properly um, uh, you know geo reference or ortho rectified every person a drone expert uh, will have its own associated errors you know and there would be some kind of a shift in it so if we have a proper library right from this particular time and we have a, you know some kind of a policy which uh, then it would be rather helpful even if this can be shared you know between the agencies drone images which is at the starting uh, point of you know drone industry right now if we can have such kind of a policy that people can share that drone uh, images you know in some legal manner it can be very helpful for all, especially planners you know because you require uh, drone images because uh, it's kind of a well, it's not all weather but you can say uh, at any point of time you can fly your own drone and record it today it's rainy you know that to, to tomorrow it's a sunny day you can go and fly your own drone uh, within few hours you can still capture uh, a good image high resolution image for your planning satellite image no matter what we say has its own limitation you know it's return time you know it takes you days to return back to the same area and it has issues associated with the high resolution even do there are all weather satellite images but these are not all high resolution images you know so those all things can be tackled very easily even uh, uh, with the, the drone so we have a very good platform designed by the government right digital sky is a platform tackled by <coughs> created by dgca right 
drone survey of india sorry drone survey sorry drone survey in india so here he, there are there are few policies that they have framed because earlier if like in last one or two years you know a lot of people had purchased the drone and it was not on record of the government and the flight anywhere they wanted you know whether it's a restricted zone or unrestricted uh, areas uh, uh, you know and there was no record of it and because of it you know there were a lot of illegal or not activities associated with the terrorism you know there was all such kind of fears so government actually came up with a very good policy though it's very strict right now which of course is good in a way uh, but then there are they are going to have a second version of it uh, to uh, have to have some kind of liberalize that policies you know uh, but apparently it, it makes the drone very costly right now the drone I, I, i'm just mentioning over here uh, i'm actually in a process of purchasing one right now or you know ordered uh, plan i mean the finalized one and uh, uh, the one initially i thought was you know some some that was again you know before covid was this dji which is one of the finest drone that we have today right and it's a chinese uh, no, not to mention it's a chinese one uh, but then they it cost again so it's cheap as well right 25000 30000 50000 150 lakh 1.5 lakhs or something like that right at the most now because of the policies that we have framed which is very good which uh, does not allow operators to fly the drone without the permission of dgca so uh, there are some modules that you have to fit in your drone which is mandatory and if you are not registered it illegal and it can you know attract any big you know issues if, if you are in coastal area or board you know get hold of you uh you know so that's something which you have to consider while flying the drone in india at least for now so i had just uh uh cap uh, fuse like just for the information but it's better to you know check it online uh, and learn it in detail uh, rather than going to my slides uh, going through my slides but i was just uh, you know Oh, oh, okay. A few slides, just for the sake of informing you that what are all these uh, policies that they are friend like. So in drone in India now has five categories. You know that one is nano, one is micro, small, medium, and large. Nano is like less than two fifty grams, and the speed uh, that the operational. Uh, altitude is 50 feet. Now here I believe or I have heard rather that they are going to update it now because now since the you know fly with the speed of you know a, 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 a very good uh, you know car rather faster than that. So there are technologies uh, already there you know. So now they are going to even put a restriction uh, in terms of the speed you know that you cannot fly uh, uh, more than this speed. So you will have to uh, block it. Uh, uh, design it that way that it does not fly uh, uh, in beyond a particular speed. So nano drone again. Right now you can have a small drone. These are generally toy toy drones. Uh, and as the experts say, it's not really possible for anyone to do uh, you know any kind of a uh, you know a tracking uh, uh, with such kind of a uh, small with drones. You know, but and there are micro drones. You know, uh, from two point. Two to fifty grams to two kg. Now these are very important for planners, land use experts, or everyone. Because it has some some liberty of flying, which is good enough for our you know practical projects. You know, uh, so this is this is one category. My my drone also falls in this category. Now there is small drones from two kgs to twenty five kgs and you know twenty five kgs to one fifty kgs medium and beyond one fifty kgs. These are few drones you know which are usually as you know considered for you know uh, again for agriculture some kind of you know uh, uh, you know this uh, sprinkling of you know uh, fertilizers or you know uh, the medicines and all those things you know for other purposes as well but these are few categories so now again what are what are the 
the uh, equipments or modules that makes three this drone very costly now the minimum that i have found you know the the cheapest drone with all uh, this restriction that like they have to have a gps uh, with, uh, mostly every drone has you know return to home module anti collision lights that has to be there you know, blinking and all id plates government will provide you with an id plate fire proof uh, unique id plates then uh, what flight controller with flight data logging capabilities RFIDs and seems and one important portion is no permission, no takeoff. NP NT module. Now this is very important. All the drone have to have this NP NT module. And what it says is that you cannot fly unless you are given the permission. And your drone will not fly it by itself. I believe. You know, if the permission has been not given by uh, uh, digital sky. Platform or the local authorities or DGC, you know, who's controlling this uh, thing. So these particular modules and such kind of system makes the drone uh, very costly. Uh, now the drone, which where you know we were able to purchase it in like few thousand rupees, it has gone in less. You know, the minimum or the cheapest drone. I'll not mention the company, but the cheapest drone that I have found uh, so far is like three point five lakhs or four four lakhs rather. I mean, without GST with GST, you know, it will go beyond 4.5 or even 5 lakhs. And this is the cheapest one, uh, which you may feel it fits your project, or otherwise, you, for surveillance, you have to have different cameras. So, again, you know, it will go beyond that. So, at least you have to, if you are into like drone, uh, you know, industry, or if you are interested in this thing, you have at least spare like 5 to 8 lakh rupees uh, if you want to do such kind of a, uh, you know, if you want to have such kind of a drone system at your place you know again the software itself are very costly the good ones that i have found out you know starts with like four lakh rupees software i mean drone is like four lakh rupees uh starting range and the software if you want to process those images you have to have a very good software to ease your project otherwise there are very cumbersome free open source code, uh, software as well but i didn't i was not able to get a good result with my level of expertise in drone right now i don't have that much of experience in drone but right maybe after a few months uh, of flying i may have uh, uh, some kind of an expert level but uh, i have to go with a, uh, you know professional grade software you know there are one or two which are very good and it starts from four lakh rupees which cost rather four lakh rupees so you have to consider that as well you know there are other of course there are other platforms if someone is interested i'll mention later on the other platforms which uh, can process your data on on data to data basis like if you want to process like 100 images the cost would be like few thousand rupees thousand images cost would be some some you know 30 40 thousand rupees something like that so if you don't want to you uh, you know uh, invest in a lifetime license or subscription you can just have a, a, a project to project processing of your drone data and, and it will be much cheaper if there are few projects in hand you know if there are more i would suggest to purchase it rather than go with this thing so basically the idea is uh, that uh, civil aviation requirement car section 3 they have this kind of uh, procedures you know you any drone that you are possessing right now whosoever is owning it might be knowing it right you have to register on dgca digital sky platform now they have again opened it uh, a few days back or probably last, till last month they have uh, closed uh, the listing of the drone now they have again opened it so you can register your drone at a digital sky platform and you will be provided with drone acknowledgement number and ownership acknowledgement number now this DNON does not give you permission to fly it only gives you the permission to own it owning it without DNON and ON is illegal and uh, simply putting it at your house or office will also be illegal so if anyone catches you then still you will have to face legal uh, problems but with this ownership you know at least you have informed government that you have this drone and this model number from so and so date so at least uh, you are not hidden anything because this drone right now can be misused for many purposes so it's better to declare if anyone has any kind of a drone at least uh, nano drone they are they are not considered it right now the toy drones that you know the kids fly you know the toy drones are uh, uh, kept aside uh, with all these things but uh, it's still better you check it on head for all the details uh, in their way 
websites you know then basically uh, now once that is the new if you want to have a, a legal flying license you have to apply for unique identification number uin which if you have a, a drone you have to mention the drone model and the manufacturing agent i know i just uh, a uh, clip some few portions of it uh, put it on the slide within two days they they, they say that they clear your uh, procedures and then after that uh, these are again nano uh, not considered uh, then requirement of issue of unmanned aircraft operating permit so uaop is also required now the, the, the here nano drones and the micro drones right are uh, uh, uh given the liberty of not being able uh, not not requiring a, a uaop license so this is good that is why i said that a micro drone might fit our uh, you know budget as well as our most of the requirement of the project that where you don't have to uh, uh, have such kind of a uaop uh, uh, you know permit then you the validity is for fires and you have to have again nano uh, not this is not applicable for nano and micro category so that is 2 kg uh, uh, till 2 kg you know so you don't even have to have a pilot training otherwise the problem is and especially with the covid situation that we are having we cannot go to those training center it's not possible they, they probably might have go such kind of a training as of now but uh, still it's still risky to go there so if you want to fly any drone beyond 2 kg you will have to have a pilot license drone pilot pilot license you know and that you have to uh, go to their uh, authorized training centers probably they take they have five days of training and then you will have to apply for uh, this flying uh, uh, this uh, uh, training certificate so and if you have purchased micro drone or nano drone drone less than 2 kg you are not not uh, required to have a pilot uh, license but you of course require a training the manufacturer of the drone will give you the training either at your location or at uh, their location like how to fly and all those things right so you are supposed to uh, understand and learn it properly because if any kind of an accident happens which you know uh, uh, <laughs> which creates a problem for some some other person you will be answerable uh, so not having not requiring a training uh, from dgca does not give you a uh, uh, liberty of uh, you know flying a, in any time any place uh, any way you want you know still you have to take all the permissions now again any kind of a drone that you own you know your drone flying is restricted only to day and visible line of sight the los that they say generally visible line of sight uh, i believe is 1.5 kilometers in all the directions you know so you said uh, being in the center of the the that flying uh, uh, flight path uh, flight path 1.5 kilometer i believe is the visible line of sight that they have considered so you cannot fly beyond uh, uh, 1.5 kilometers so that is something that you have to consider if you want to fly the drone <coughs> and there are uh, conditions meteorological conditions you know that there are they have some restrictions related to the uh, you know wind velocity and all those things so if you have such some kind of a uh, uh, you know environment or weather you cannot or should not fly so there are policies that are there you can find it out at their site you know so these are all different things that you have to consider before uh, you know planning a drone flight uh, and as a planner i suppose it's very good uh, uh, you can say uh, 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 machine for remote sensing that we have it nowadays in at, at least our in our time you know that earlier it was very so difficult to plan now we have so much of higher resolution image with us so these are all the, these are the list of uh, i have also kept a list of approved drone where from where you can purchase your drone you know uh, so this 
these are few good companies or these are few listed companies at uh, DGCA or Digital Sky platforms. I have just snapshot, taken a snapshot from there and you know, kept it over here. There may be many, I don't know, but it's just a snapshot. You can search it at uh, DGCA website for more if there are any, you know. So there are few good companies uh, over here, uh, 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 which might they and they give provide a very good support. Any of the companies that you have provide very good information and support you know i learned these things from then then only by you know in process of purchasing the drone they informed me about all these things you know what i'm mentioning those this topic thank you hello uh, thank you Dr. Uh, i think so uh, it was quite interesting the, whole, uh, the webinar uh, went very well uh, because they were participants, uh, slowly they collapsed. But uh, whosoever was left uh, has uh, taken the full uh, advantage of your knowledge. I will uh, uh, give a vote of thanks. Or do you have anything to say, sir? Uh, sir, it was really interesting. Very, really interesting. Yes, I hope sir. the participants have benefited from it. Thank you, sir. The number may be like that. But the, yeah. this, will, this will interest the, to the people only those who are interested in this topic. So that is not an issue. Yes, yes definitely. Anyway, thank you for, yeah. So we'll be waiting for you on 22nd also. Yes, yeah. sir. That will be more, uh, I think so. I think that is more uh, topic. More people yeah. will be there. And the more professional, where yeah. he's dealing with the technology. Also is new to me also. But uh, there are many people working on this because day to day specialization has uh, taken over uh, many places. Uh, so, sir, should I give the vote of thanks and uh, yeah, yeah. call it day? Yeah. So, I think Pragnesh sir could be hai. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Unmute karo pehle, sir. Nee, nee. Parth Hingu ko koi question tha. Isliye before we conclude, Parth. From Australia, I think he's in Australia. Uh, chat uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, let he said yes, sir. Because he was asking let him ask. and then so he has got more than what he must have expected. Uh, though tomorrow he can go and straight away buy a drone. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking to buy a drone. <laughs> Uh, it's it's too so costly. <laughs> it's like forty to forty fifty thousand dollars drone. Uh, forty. Yeah. Fifty thousand rupees drone uh, dollars over here. Yeah, actually, it's worth it because the kind of sensor uh, that they provide, you know, it's far beyond the capabilities of the usual DJI drones. You know, they actually have a high resolution. You can actually have a three D image in the US. So I have done that. I have done that right now also, two days back. I had generated a 3D model of a city, right? Uh, but since it's not legal to share those you know, data sets, I don't even know uh, whether it was legal in that area to fly, but it was a demo that I had taken uh, uh, with some number. I had actually yeah. processed, you know, create a fantastic. We can fly Mavic Mini over here, Mavic Mini. Yeah, Mavic Mini, that is Mavic Mini, it's like. Uh, but it's see, when you. Yeah. Dr. Nijar, uh, uh, Parth Hingu is our uh, alumni student yeah. who is uh, right now studying his master's in Australia. So he is uh, today on the platform from Australia. So that of the uh, achievement what uh, our college has gained that even the students are in touch from far away lands. So he is uh, since the beginning and not left. Many of us uh, have seen that many of us uh, have left. But uh, and it has paid to Bharat also. Uh, Info uh, Dr. Nirjal Lakia has uh, given. Uh, I am also very happy. Sir is also happy, and Pranesh sir is also uh, feeling proud that his student uh, Bharat Hindu has uh, attended <laughs> the webinar. And, no, no, he is taking an experience. Sir. Uh, such webinars would. Uh, he is actually Andy. taking an experience for his webinar. It was his. Yeah, he has to give a webinar on photography. Uh, uh, Lakhya, sir, you are also a he is also a photographer. He is a fantastic uh, uh, skill in photography, which was uh, 
uh, what he gained from uh, Tejal Parikar, who was from Seb. So he must be knowing him, uh, Tejal Parik, and uh, he was teaching here. And Parth uh, was a student, so he gained the complete knowledge, purchasing lenses and different type of cameras. Yeah, coming up and yeah. very good photography. Very good. Yes, really. Good. I also share some DSLR. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, DSLR. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. First time we saw it. What do you say? Sir? Should I start? Uh, I took so much of time. Actually, I tried to. Actually, was planning to compile it and bring it down to one hour, but it was just not possible for me because, again, this platform is new for me. You know how to present it in online platform, and again, generally the lectures are of two hours. So all my you know slides are designed in a way which you know <laughs> takes uh, you know at least two hours of <laughs> the time. So hey, this platform is new for yeah. all of us, but uh, we are uh, slowly gaining good experience. Yeah. Yeah? Like first uh, webinar was on uh, Photoshop, then uh, on landscape, then came on uh, conservation, mm -hmm. and then uh, this uh, our uh, GIS. So in all, uh, we have found really good response from uh, far places. Many professionals and other people have also shown interest, and uh, this webinar would definitely would uh, be a mark because uh, hence what we are going to have a lot of planning. Uh, sorry. Uh, Masters in architecture, in which we will have a subject which is GIS. So students uh, like here also, Athira has shown her interest. Even in today's uh, where she is doing her urban design, she uh, thinks that uh, she will be able to use. But I know that this is very difficult. GIS is a uh, real difficult. Takes ages to get used to it. I don't know whether how she would be able to have that in her studio. I would advise her to continue her studio even. Uh, without <laughs> looking towards GIS, yeah. otherwise uh, she will waste time. You know? That is what I'm saying on webinar. We, we have just introduced her so, with the global mapper software, so they will be doing uh, some cultural analysis and easy, easy is plan. Otherwise, yes, it is yes. like uh, doing a micro surgery uh, to that mm -hmm. level. You know, somebody is a surgeon and he is doing uh, he is ophthalmologist and he is doing a micro surgery so a student can't handle this platform yes, of gis so if he gains the knowledge that tomorrow whenever he has enough time and has a very dedicated uh, 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 limited work in which that this work will be very useful especially in masters in masters courses and beyond that in phd and uh, so uh, I would uh, thank everybody uh, participating here, our principals are also. I would thank our uh, chairman, Sri Bhaskarve Patel, uh, to uh, give us uh, uh, permission and platform uh, like Google uh, Classroom and Google Meet, sorry. Uh, and I would thank our uh, trustees of uh, NIST, that is New Era uh, School Trust, uh, to uh, again provide such a fantastic uh, opportunity to let uh, uh, people from far up also to uh, interact on this uh, webinar platform. I will thank uh, our uh, team consisting of uh, uh, Dhaab Adhavala, Garbet Nair, and other uh, students who have uh, contributed in creating posters and uh, sending the links to all the groups of students and to other professionals. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank other uh, administrative staffs also in our college. Uh, with this, I will give a, a final uh, end to our webinar. And uh, hope uh, all of us will meet on 22nd with the new uh, more interesting and informative women Dr. Uh, uh, Nirjal Lakya. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you Nirjal Lakya, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and the participant who had such integrations to uh, sit till the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye. 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 Bye.
Okay. Bye, Professor. See you, see you. See you.